you have microorganisms growing, living on the stone and actually under the surface of the stone. And it depends on the exact stone itself that's going to determine, you know, what, wh how the growth is, is attaching itself. And so with the marble, um, especially a porous marble, um, it's going to tend to have a lot of staining under the surface. Um, with the sandstone, that's a, a well-compacted sandstone, it's going to have much more on the surface itself. But anyway, um, algae, lichen, moss, fungus, molds are kind of a, a blanket um, for all these different microorganisms that are literally living, attaching themselves to the stone and even getting under the surface. Um, so what has become the most popular cleaner, and I've been in this field since even before this was invented, and um, so, um, but this has been around for about a couple decades now, is the D2 biological solution, and it's used by the National Park Service a lot. Um, it's not limited, it wasn't invented for gravestones, it was invented for architecture, for structures, for buildings, and things like New York Public Library, the whole building has been cleaned with this, obviously not with a little spray bottle. <laughs> um, so um, it comes in quarts, gallons, five gallon buckets, and even uh, 55 gallon drums that we do send to places like Gettysburg and uh, Mount Auburn, as I mentioned previously, the oldest garden cemetery in America, use this product. Um, I'll just mention that there was testing behind this before this started to become the most common cleaner. And there is an organization that is um, part of the government, which is a long acronym. It's called the NCPTT, which stands for the National Center for Preservation Technology and Training. Um, a friend of mine is one of the main people there that does a lot of the testing, Jason Church and he has a master's degree in science and conservation material uh, science and um, or whatever exactly his title is but he's a conservator and he does testing and he also does training like this and they also have videos and they have a website so you might want to check out the NCPTT. Um, so the thing about this product it was actually invented by not the, the the person who owns it is not the inventor it was actually invented by a guy named Norman Weiss who is a professor at Columbia in New York City. And he um, is kind of a pioneer in it. He's invented many other products as well. Um, so um, this is already in a solution, okay? So you do not have to dilute it, and we can spray it right on a stone. We don't have to pre-wet the stone. And other cleaners that may be required in many situations because of the chemistry is different, but with the D2, we do not have to, okay? So it's as simple as this. We can come right over here and we can just spray it on the stone, okay? And these sprayers are gonna have like a spray off and then a stream and off. And so I'm just gonna spray it on the stone, okay? Now also, I poured out of a gallon and because this yellow one has D2 on it, so it's easy to identify. It's gonna be much quicker, so I don't have to squeeze the trigger. It's annoying. And so I'm just going to spray it um, right onto the stone, okay? Now, one way to use this product is just to spray it on the stone and walk away. And that's going to be application only. And on a highly eroded marble, that's probably your best bet, okay? Sometimes you're going to get a color change. So I'll put it on both of these stones. And um, so here's a thin marble tablet. It's about an inch and three quarters thick. Sometimes we're going to get an immediate color change, and we've uh, kind of dubbed that a color bloom. And you can liken it to leaves changing colors on a deciduous tree in the fall before they fall off. It's actually a different mechanism, uh, you know, from chemistry, but it's a very similar phenomenon. And so when we get an immediate color change, we know we're going to have pretty quick results. We're going to tend to get that color change in warmer temperatures, okay? And it's, it's occurring right here, it's turning orange, okay? So I'm just going to do these two stones at once. So we have one brown stone and one marble, okay? So um, I'll just finish applying it. Now if we're going to do application only, which, which I do oftentimes, especially on eroded marble, um, all we have to do is spray it on and walk away. What's going to happen is that a lot of the cleaner, so, some is going to get drawn under the surface, some is going to stay on the outside and evaporate. But enough is going to get drawn into the surface 
that it's going to have a residual effect. It's not harmful because it's designed for this application. Okay, but other cleaners it could be very harmful to just spray on a dry stone. And as I mentioned before, we never want to put an acid-based cleaner onto a marble. Um, it might be an option in other situations. Okay, so usually we'll apply it if we're going to do like a brush method, like we're going to do at least on this sandstone. And we want to usually give it about 10 or 15 minutes to kind of dwell on it. But we can kind of fast forward right now. So again, this is just the D2 was applied. So it's cleaning with quaternary ammoniums. That is not ammonia. Okay, it's not the same thing, and so there's there's many many uh, I think hundreds of quaternary ammoniums, and this is um, a few of them are combined in very specific ratios. Then there's also surfactants, which are basically like soaps, and then there's wetting agents and buffers to make the whole product do what it does. Okay, so um, we're gonna just let it dwell for a minute, and we'll talk about brushes, and so. These two brushes are actually the same kind of fiber. This one is wet still from yesterday and it's a little dirty, um, but this is how it started looking, believe it or not. And so um, they're different shapes, but they're the same fiber. I'm talking about the fiber on the brushes. And these are going to be the most friendly for cleaning historic stone. And they're a natural fiber bristle. It's called Tempico. And it gets softer when it gets wet. It absorbs a lot of water like a sponge. It's a natural fiber. It's derived from some different sources, but um, it's my understanding today one of the biggest sources is from agave. So from agave we get Tempico and we get the best tequila. So you got to like agave, okay? So um, what we're going to do is we're just going to take some water now. We're going to want to pre-wet the brush because it's very dry to begin with. It's a, this is a brand new brush, okay? And so these, I'll just actually back up a little and I want to just show some because I see a lot of problems with people using sprayers, and so just to go over the process. It's a little handheld sprayer. You can get these at home centers, different brands and things like that. Um, these are the ones that we sell um, currently. And so we don't want to fill this to the top with water. We want to leave some space for air because we're gonna pump it and the air is gonna make pressure, okay? So if we fill it to the top, it won't work and we could just wreck it first time we try to use it, okay? So don't fill it to the top. The second thing is we're going to put the, the top on and then make sure it's not cross-threaded, okay? That means it'll spin on easily, and if it cross-threads, it means it's, it'll go crooked and it won't ever fully connect, okay? I'm just telling you everything I see happen. So I, I've seen it a hundred times, so I just started telling people what to do. Then make it tight so it hits the seal and then it will pump up and build up pressure, okay? You can feel it building pressure, it's harder to pump, okay? Is this distilled or tapped? I can't hear you. The general term that you will use in, 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 even in conservation is potable water, which is water that you could drink. So as opposed to like swamp water or irrigation water, and so it, distilled is not necessary. Remember that every time it rains, there's all kinds of things coming down with the rainwater, and it's going to get that every time it rains, maybe this afternoon. So um, it does not have to be distilled. On very high level conservation, things that aren't outside, yes, that could be a situation, but with things outside in an outdoor environment, we do not need distilled water, okay? So then the last thing about these sprayers is there is an adjustment to go from a stream and if we tighten it, it'll be a little more of a mist. Depending on how we're using it, we can vary that as well. Okay, that's it. That's just basic uh, background information, okay? So the next thing, I'll, I'll pick this brush back up, and so we can come back. Now, I, I already applied the cleaner, but it's starting to dry, okay? And so what I'm gonna do is just re-wet it a little, and, and this is just this is a good example because it's just gonna clean up really nicely. And actually, let me back up a little. Um, so we'll come back to that in a second. Now, when there's raised lichen, we can use plastic scrapers, okay? These are an option. In many situations, there's not raised lichen and we don't really need these, okay? But we want a soft plastic. Generally, that's a flexible plastic and it bends. And the idea is that we can save time by using scrapers and 
These are inexpensive. The plastic wears away pretty quickly and we discard them. The idea is they're much softer than the stone and it just saves time and keeps the brushes from getting clogged. So we can go ahead and scrape the raised lichen lightly. The first thing, just to back up, is I already inspected the stone and it's stable. I don't see any spalling or any delamination. The next thing is the whole stone is well secured in the ground. And another thing that I tend to overshoot because there's a lot of subject matter here, we should always photograph everything before we work on it. The one thing we can't recreate is the photos before we touch it, okay? We can fill out assessment sheets and it could say what we did and everything <coughs> after the fact, but we want to document everything. So before we work on it, cleaning being the lowest level, but even with cleaning, we photograph it first, okay? So then the next thing is we could come in and start scraping and I'll do some representative scraping. Now, we don't want to scrape a dry stone for two reasons. Um, when we wet it, it's going to um, tend to loosen up the uh, lichens mostly, is what's um, standing proud of the surface. But also, we don't want to breed the spores of the uh, microorganisms. So when we wet it, it tends to just drop to the ground, okay? So um, I'll just kind of do a little bit of scraping, and then we'll go back to the brushing. And you get the idea. So someone can come in and, and do some of this after, but I'm just kind of doing some representative um, work here, okay? So we can scrape the, the high areas. Okay, now we're going to come back in with the brush we just started to use. And I picked a stone that would clean well, and so it's just it's going to be a pleasure. And there's quite a few of these here. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> that are in really good condition. <clears throat> what I see generally in workshops is that people will apply the cleaner and they brush and brush and brush and they don't use enough water. The idea is you use a lot of water and water is a lubricant and it, it keeps from having um, an abrasive effect when you're brushing. <clears throat> Um, say usually 10 or 15 minutes to start letting it soak in. Okay. Um, however, we could apply this and come back in an hour or two and spritz some water on and it'll reactivate it. We could apply this today and come back tomorrow, especially if we don't have heavy rain, and we could brush it tomorrow. Okay. Another trick I use if you're looking for quick results, let me just go ahead and rinse this out. Okay, so this is a really impressive result. Now, um, I know somebody has one of these here, but this sprayer here comes with a pump, but this is an upgrade, and you take the pump out, and you screw this in, and so we have some technological um, advantages here, and now we turn this on, and we don't have to pump anymore. Is the garden hose accessible to the area? Um, can you use a garden hose? Um, you can, but it makes a big mess, a lot of water. Most sites I work at don't have running water, um, and um, you could use a garden hose as long as you're not, you know, going right against it. So that is a possibility. Um, so now we can rinse much more easily. Yeah, most sites I work at don't have running water. And even if they do, if you're 150 yards away, the amount of time you take getting that out is not worth it. Thank you. So that's the basic idea, in, in very fast forward. I'll just back up a little, and I kind of just jumped over it. We used a Tempico brush, um, which is the softer fiber. <clears throat> we could have also used a synthetic fiber, which is um, like a nylon or polyester. Most brushes today are synthetic. And the difference is they don't absorb any water at all, so they don't really get softer. The Tempico is generally softer, and it gets softer when it gets wet. T-A-M-P-I-C-O. Tampico. Anyway, the brushes that we sell primarily are from the last significant brush manufacturer in America. There used to be a lot of them. But uh, there's a company that we use primarily in Texas, Magnolia Brush. So they actually make these in Texas. The vast majority of brushes you'll get at a home center are imported, as they say. And you can guess where they're coming from. 
So um, we like to support and try to do the best products made in America. Um, and um, we also import products from all over the world. The sprayers that we sell primarily um, include these handhelds and the, um, you know, the bigger sprayers are made by uh, Fountainhead and they're based in upstate New York and they've been making sprayers since the early 1900s. Um, so, um, any questions? It's just like a crash course on cleaning. Yeah. And I like a small brush on top for the curves. Exactly. So, thank you. So, we have a few different sizes of smaller brushes and we can also use these. These are not metal. These are like nylon. They vary in how, um, you know, kind of stiff they are. But certainly on the, um, on the edge here, there's tooling and we could use any one of these littler brushes um, to work on the detailed areas and so um, um, you know we can it's going to be more effective and obviously the bigger brush won't go in these little corners like this so we can use different brushes in tighter areas um, D2 is made for biological growth which is microorganisms which is again algae, lichen, moss, fungus, molds it's not going to be effective at all against things like graffiti or, <clears throat> or metal staining um, or uh, mineral staining like from hard water. So um, any other questions related? Does, I mean, does the D2 uh, kill the grass around the stone um, it'll it, it potentially could stunt it, but it won't really kill it. Um, it'll, it'll generally come, come back. Um, if you're concerned with that, um, simple uh, solution. If you pre-wet the ground in front of it so it gets it saturated with water before the cleaning, then when you clean it, it won't absorb it, and it'll tend to just uh, it'll be so diluted it'll have very little effect. So um, that that's that's a, a very effective method. Now there's another way we can speed up the process and we could apply the cleaner and put a plastic bag over it and we could leave that on and, and we need to cover uh, put like a bungee around the bottom or tape it and so the idea is to keep them keep it wet which is called dwell time and the longer it stays wet the faster it'll clean okay and so um, the way D2 works normally is we apply it say like in this situation say if we weren't gonna brush but we could brush lightly but we would apply it and then it's gonna some will evaporate, but some is soaking into the, under the surface like a sponge. Like if you put dish soap on a sponge and you start to wash the dishes, it'll seem like there's no soap left, but if you squeeze the sponge, you'll get more soap out. And it's the same principle. So there's going to be some of the active ingredients, the quaternary ammoniums especially, will be under the surface. And so what will happen is it'll become inactive when it dries. Okay, the cells are not communicating so it's just going to sit there. However, next time it rains or even with a morning dew, it'll reactivate and so it's going to wax and wane and that's how it has residual cleaning effect. So every time it gets wet, it's going to reactivate. So if you just came out and sprayed it every day, once a day, regardless of the weather, it would clean quicker also that way. So any other questions or comments? Yes, one application and then we're going to just use water after. We don't have to keep going at it with D2. Um, another thing I'll say, and I, I wasn't really talking about the situation or condition of this tablet stone. I was looking at the condition. It's in excellent condition. This is way sunken. And so that the inscription is going right in the ground. Um, it doesn't appear to have been broken, although that's always a possibility. And it seems to just be the wrong elevation. And so that it should come way up and it probably will sit about this high but what I'm saying is the inscription goes right in the ground then under that there could be a border design or even an epitaph I don't know what's going on under there and that wasn't really relevant to the cleaning I just knew it was a good example because the stone doesn't have any spalling or delamination and I knew it would clean up beautifully and it did um, so any other questions? Yeah. Real quick. The stone next to you is marble right? Yes. Do you use the same type of brush? Yeah, I mean, generally, I think the Tempico brushes are softer and more friendly to the stone, so I prefer them. But I will say also, natural bris uh, sorry, synthetic bristles like this vary a lot in how aggressive they are. As long as we use a synthetic bristle brush that is more friendly, in other words, you can rub it across a sensitive area of your skin, and it's not like, because some brushes are very stiff. So we don't want to use those on a soft stone like this because the stone is 
you know, is, is, is weathering badly. So we don't want to use um, an aggressive brush on a soft stone. We would never want to use a metal brush either, especially. But we can come in now and just introduce some more water and just brush it. I think it's going to clean really well. And another thing, you want basically on most of these on these historic stones, we're hardly pushing. Okay, we're just putting a little pressure on. We're not grinding away. What I see a lot of people doing is again they they, they they put the cleaner on and the stone's almost dry and they're just grinding and grinding and grinding and it does clean it that way because basically the dirt is acting like cleanser and so you are going to get a good cleaning effect but it's diminishing the stone a little bit so just think of it this way anytime you brush there is a mechanical effect and the more you clean stones with a brush the, the you're wearing away a little bit every time but in you know maybe you know, a ten thousandth of an inch, if we're very sensitive, it's not discernible, and that way we can, you know, interpret it better and get good photos and document what it says. But the, the other option is to do application only and be more patient. And generally I find that in many situations, like a stone like this, like six months later will be completely clean. You have to be very patient. And um, I've done um, thousands and thousands of stone, a big cemetery where I've done a lot of work, as I mentioned, in Windsor, Connecticut, which is the uh, oldest dated stone is there for Reverend Hewitt. Um, there's, there's, there's thousands of marble stones like, like the stones here that are less old, you know, from the 1800s. And I, I often, and I'm going to be doing another project there, um, I work there um, annually. Um, there's always new problems, and again, there's thousands of stones there, so things always come up. It's, it's, a, it's, it's a never ending process. But so every year when I work there, I tend to be there in the fall, and I will do application only, just like I did to this without the brushing, to like 200 stones or something like that. And all I'll do is, I mean, and we have backpack sprayers also, and that's an option, but I like this gallon size, and I'll take a gallon of D2, pour it in here you know, click the button for the pump to come on, it's already got pressure in it, and then just treat stone after stone, and I'll, I'll do it, say, in November, what I find usually by the next April or May, most of them are completely clean, without any brushing at all. And so that's the most friendly to the stone, because there's no mechanical abrasion at all. Um, so, uh, yeah. So the, you're saying, are you, are you saying that the brush is to more to distribute the cleanser than to scrub? I'm just saying you want to be very minimalistic and very sensitive because these are deteriorated stones. So if we're rubbing, a, if it's a wet stone and we're lightly brushing it, it's very low mechanical abrasion. Okay. But if you push hard, right. then so it's you're much. Not scrubbing, you're just smooth, smushing it around. Pretty much. Like it's a base. I mean, and. How dirty is a base? Put it this way: it depends on the particular stone, and if you're cleaning a, if you're cleaning a granite you could be much more uh, aggressive and much more firm with it because the granite has much higher density and you're not going to have an effect on the granite. Okay? Does it make a difference if you start from the top or from the bottom? That's a great question and I usually address it. And so the reason you'll hear to clean from the bottom up is with a different cleaner in a different situation. So the short answer to your question is when you're cleaning gravestones with D2, no. It's, 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 it's pertinent information coming from a different subject with a different cleaner by people that don't understand what they're talking about. Does D2 uh, concentrate? Or? No, it's ready to use and so um, on stones like this that haven't been cleaned, um, it's going to be most effective just right out of the container. Now, if, 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 say, the question also is how long are they going to stay clean, and say the stone, say in a few years, um, uh, say we clean them, and like the, there's some white ones there that have been cleaned, they look really good. Um, say in a two, it's hard to tell, and it depends on climate, it depends on rainfall, it depends on the porosity of the stone, on tree canopy, the region you're in. But say in two years, you start to get a little growth. It's not going to be like this. It's going to be just like a little green. You'll see like a little green on it. Then you could do like 50% D2, 50% water. So like you could make one gallon into two and then just spray it on, no brushing, and that will stop it from coming back. It'll just, it'll take it out quickly and it'll keep it clean. And so, but generally it's going to be uh, most effective and safe to use, undiluted. It's a solution ready to use.